fevers. They've certainly been on everyone's mind this year, but a surprisingly difficult question to answer is what temperature defines a fever? Should it be the same for everyone in every situation, or should there actually be different cutoffs? I'm going to warn you right now that some of what you think you know about fevers is probably wrong. Before we get to fevers, though, let's first start by talking about normal body temperature and the myth of 98.6. That's right, the myth. But like all myths, this one started somewhere. In this case, that was with mid-19th century German physician Karl Reinhold August Wunderlich. Wunderlich was the first physician to seriously study human body temperature, and he is generally credited as the first to promote the idea that fevers were a symptom of disease and should not be framed as the disease itself. Relevant for this video, he also recorded 1 million axillary temperature readings from 25,000 individuals as part of a massive study spanning many years. Based on those readings, he identified 37.0 Celsius, or 98.6 Fahrenheit, as the mean temperature in adults. This is the origin of the widespread belief, at least in America, that 98.6 is normal body temperature. But right off the bat, we can identify four big problems with this myth. First, Wunderlich never said that 98.6 was the single normal temperature, just that it was the mean or the average around which people's temperatures were normally distributed. Second, these were measurements taken in his patients who were in variable health. Life expectancy in Europe during the time when Wunderlich was recording these temperatures was about 40 years. How many of his study subjects were walking around with occult cancers, periodontal infections, or indolent tuberculosis? all diseases which increase body temperature. Third, we now know, and presumably Wunderlich knew this as well, that axillary temperatures, that is, temperatures measured by holding a thermometer in someone's armpit with their arm at their sides, his preferred method, are lower than oral, rectal, and true core body temperatures. And last, how were his foot-long mercury thermometers being recalibrated? Contemporary mercury thermometers, which have been largely phased out due to concerns about toxicity, are still considered to be extremely accurate, but manufacturing standards were not the same 150 years ago. We actually have some idea as to how accurate his thermometers were because one physician tracked down an original Wunderlich mercury thermometer at Philadelphia's Mütter Museum of Antique Medical Equipment and Medical Curiosities. With the museum's blessing, he tested the thermometer against modern versions and discovered that it registered about one and a half to two degrees Celsius warmer than it should. Wunderlich presumably used more than one thermometer for his million temperature readings, so we shouldn't make a generalized statement about the amount or even the direction of his inaccuracies, just that substantial inaccuracies were present. There have been contemporary attempts to redetermine normal body temperature. One 2002 review found an average oral temperature of 37.4 Celsius, or 97.5 Fahrenheit, while a 2017 study of 244,000 readings found a mean temperature of 36.6, or 97.9. Another 2020 study from right here at Stanford looked at temperature readings from various data sources going back 150 years and found that average temperature has actually dropped 0.5 degrees Celsius, or 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit, since the mid-19th century. The authors included evidence that this measurement drop was real and not only an artifact of systemic bias in the measurements. They speculated that a reduction in the population level of inflammation was the most plausible explanation, which itself was due to improved sanitation, dental hygiene, decreased rates of tuberculosis, and the age of antibiotics. Aside from 98.6 being too high a mean, another underappreciated issue is the normal diurnal variation in body temperature. When temperatures are repeatedly measured in the same individual over many days, a pattern emerges in which temperature is lowest in the early morning and highest in the late afternoon and early evening. The difference between average low and average high readings is 0.5 Celsius and 0.9 Fahrenheit. Even Wunderlich, with his inaccurate thermometers, was able to observe this. Body temperature has also been found to be slightly higher in women on average, but as many women who have planned a pregnancy may know, 
This is partly related to the menstrual cycle. Specifically, during the cycle, a woman's temperature reaches its lowest point just before ovulation. After ovulation occurs, the corpus luteum, that is, what remains of the ovarian follicle after release of a mature ovum, secretes progesterone. The progesterone leads to an increase in temperature over several days by about 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit, which then lasts about two weeks until the corpus luteum regresses and progesterone levels drop, just before the onset of menstrual bleeding. If all this was not complicated enough, normal body temperature drops in advanced age, while individuals with cirrhosis, hypothyroidism, renal disease, and heart failure typically have body temperatures slightly lower than healthy individuals. Even environmental factors, such as the ambient temperature, the season, and the dew point, have been found to influence body temperature. So now that we know identifying the normal body temperature is extremely complicated, you might guess that defining a temperature cutoff for fever is even more so. And you would be right. For one thing, where we draw that line between fever and no fever should be influenced by all of those aforementioned things. Should a fever be defined as a temperature above the normal range for the patient's sex and age, where normal is defined by the range in which an arbitrary percentage of presumably healthy patients fall, or should it be defined as a temperature above the normal range for that specific patient? Should we incorporate time of day and phase of the menstrual cycle into our definition? Or should we use a more functional definition, such as a temperature high enough to be associated with infectious disease or some adverse outcome, which might warrant a change in management? Historically, fevers have been almost universally defined as a temperature which falls above the 99th percentile among all individuals. For Wunderlich in the 19th century, he used this approach to define a fever as at or above 38.0 Celsius or 100.4 Fahrenheit. Despite all the aforementioned problems with his data, this is still the most common cutoff used by healthcare professionals in the 21st century, a cutoff some use in all patients and in all situations. Personally, I think this is a shamefully oversimplistic approach, particularly considering how integral temperature measurements are in the assessment of health and disease. In short, there is not one cutoff of what determines a fever that's equally applicable to all people. And even when considering a single specific individual at a specific time of day, there's no one cutoff. Much of medical diagnosis is grounded on the dichotomization of a continuous parameter. That is, we take some physiologic measurement that has a continuous distribution in a population, and we draw a line saying everyone who falls on this side is normal, and everyone on that side is not. A systolic blood pressure of 119 is normal, while 120 is elevated. A hemoglobin of 12 in a woman is normal, while 11.9 would get her labeled anemic. Temperature is no different. We label patients febrile or afebrile, occasionally hedging with the term low-grade fever, which for the record, I think officially means a temperature high enough that it's not normal, but low enough that you don't want to do anything about it. Body temperature is continuously distributed such that the higher the temperature, the more likely it indicates a problem. There is not a clear transition point where increasing temperature readings go from reassuring to concerning, leaving it necessarily arbitrary where to draw the line with saying a fever is present or absent. I'm reminded of this tweet, Pick a single point where gray begins, and I'll tell you what temperature should be considered a fever. So what's the bottom line here? Well, I know that many of you watching were waiting to hear a specific number. I'm really sorry, but I can't give you one. There just is not one single normal body temperature, but rather a range, and that range varies at different times of the day between different individuals, and for menstruating women, it varies at different points during the menstrual cycle. And because of this, the temperature cutoff for diagnosing a fever should also probably vary at different times of the day between different individuals and at different points during the menstrual cycle. And wherever one decides to make that cutoff, what's considered to be a fever versus not a fever, even if it is perfectly individualized, it will still be arbitrary. I know that may be frustrating to hear. It frustrates me as a physician. If this is all news to you, don't feel bad. Healthcare professionals usually only use one cutoff temperature themselves for defining a fever, 
particularly in hospitals. Interestingly, the specific cutoff is hospital dependent, usually being built directly into the electronic medical record and ordering system, usually at the whim of whoever programmed the admission order set. Most commonly, that temperature is Wunderlich 100.4, while sometimes it's 101.0, and sometimes it's something else entirely. Shockingly, many clinicians don't even know what temperature their hospital uses. It's because the so-called call MD or notify MD order that tells the nurse what temperature is high enough to warrant calling the treatment team is a default value that is part of this standard order set when a patient is admitted. It's automatic. This call MD order, it can be manually changed, but it often isn't. So the treatment team doesn't even think about the specific number for most patients, and it's certainly not individualized. None of this is logical, but it is what we do. I imagine that in the era of paper charts and handwritten orders, it was too cumbersome for doctors to decide upon and record different fever cutoffs for each patient or for it to vary according to the time of day. But surely in the era of electronic medical records, at least some of this could be done automatically where a nursing assistant records the temperature on the computer and the EMR compares that value to the normal range at that time of day for that age of patient, maybe even compares the value to that particular patient's typical normal range, and then automatically alerts if the temperature crosses an individualized fever threshold. There is no technical roadblock to doing this. It's all just a matter of education and a culture shift. And for something as fundamental to bedside clinical assessment as body temperature, particularly during a pandemic, you'd think that we would do this. In the meantime, if you're a clinician, what can you do? The first thing I'd say is for inpatient clinicians to double check the admission orders to make sure the notify doctor order lists a temperature appropriate for that specific patient. And for any clinician, inpatient or outpatient, before responding to a single temperature reading, whether that response is more tests and antibiotics for a high temperature or reassurance for a low one, first look back at that patient's historical temperatures to see how the current one compares. And if you are a patient to whom a thermometer reading of 100.2 is concerning, yet your clinician tells you, ah, don't worry about it, it's not a true fever, politely point out that not all patients have the same baseline blood pressure or heart rate, so why would we assume they all have the same baseline temperature? And remind them that while Karl Reinhold August Wunderlich was a smart and dedicated physician who made significant historical contributions to medicine, his thermometers were terrible. I hope you found this deep dive into normal body temperature and the definition of fever to be interesting. If so, you may like this video here where I debunk the frequently taught but incorrect belief that normal resting heart rate is 60 to 100. And thanks for watching.